All right, so the next topic is going to be on Visual Studio Code. Has anybody used Visual Studio Code? Okay, good. Um, so a few people. It is, this is their slogan, code editing redefined. Seems like that should be a comma and not a period, but that's what they had. So why another editor? So it is a simple text editor that supports multiple languages. So one of the things with Visual Studio is in past editions, this latest edition is not the case, but in past editions, if you wanted to use Visual Studio, you had to either install 10 different community editions that each supported their own different thing, or you had to pay for a fairly expensive, if you're just a single developer, license. Um, with 2016 or 15, whatever the latest one is, 15, um, they have their community edition, which has all the features of professional, but anybody can just download it for free and use it. Okay, so that is one reason why you might want to. Cost might have been prohibitive. Not quite as big of a thing now. Um, the other reason is with a simple text editor, you just put it on your computer and you're good to go. So I can start writing code and I can do what I need to without having to worry about getting some big installation up and running. Um, I don't know when the last time you tried to install full Visual Studio was, but this machine is fairly new. And the, when I tried to do on this one, and it's a super fast machine, it still took me about an hour and a half. So versus Visual Studio Code took me two minutes. And that was mostly just the time to download it. So that's one reason. Um, so yeah. Okay, it's also to compete with other editors like Sublime Text and Atom that are again easy to install and run. Both Sublime Text and Atom have a very strong community support. So it's not up to just Microsoft to decide what kinds of things they want their editor to do. Um, the whole community can contribute and basically say, hey, this is a new feature that I would love to have and off we go. So before that, it does integrate with most used languages. So C Sharp, C++, Java, JavaScript. Um, it integrates fully with those and you can do an entire development stack with Visual Studio Code and not really miss anything for it. Um, full debugging, full build stacks, everything. Okay, then lastly, it'll work with Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, and I have actually seen people trying to port it over to like Android and iOS, but they haven't had much success since it's kind of hard to use a text editor on mobile platforms. Um, but anyway, so these are some of the reasons why we have another editor. So let's talk about some of the features that it has. Again, built-in integration. It does have it with Git. So I find I spend a lot of time with Visual Studio, big Visual Studio, jumping back and forth. And I realize Visual Studio has Git integration now. Um, but back and forth between my Git tools and my Visual Studio code, or Visual Studio tools. Code, though, just has it built right in. And I can do everything just from the same bar that I'm accessing all my files from. Okay, it has automatic build setups with Node, C Sharp, Rust, C++, all of those. So if you are running one of those applications, you can just hit the F5 key and it will actually build out the files you need to make those things run, which is nice because it means I don't have to worry about the tool chain. Visual Studio Code will do it for me. Um, IntelliSense for most languages, and again, it's a community effort, so if anybody wants to add IntelliSense for a language that isn't currently supported, they can do that. Um, it's the same level of IntelliSense, more or less, as Big Visual Studio. It is a little bit hampered, um, but honestly, when I've been using it, I haven't noticed. So most of the stuff is right where you want it to be. Okay, and then it also has an extensible plugin system like Big Visual Studio. Um, any other code syntax highlighting you want, or any other build steps, or anything else you want to have happen, again, you can just plug right in. Okay, um, lastly, again, as I mentioned, in-app debugging. So has anybody done Node.js development? Okay, so you may know that it is a bear to try to debug. Um, Visual Studio Code, you just put your breakpoint in the code, hit F5, and it'll stop just like regular Visual Studio does. So fantastic debugging system. More of, oh, uh, and you can download Visual Studio Code just from here, which is just code.visualstudio.com. Um, again, it's available for all three platforms, and then if you want to look at their blogs and their updates, you can do that as well. Uh, 1.9 was just released, I think, three weeks ago. So, fairly up to date. All right, so, here's Visual Studio Code. 
you've got your little system of quick menu items over here. Um, for the most part, though, this is going to be what you're used to. You've got your code editing. You've got your what is equivalent to the solution explorer. Um, open files here if I want to have you know, my split view. OK. There we go. Again, I can do that. Obviously, when I'm zoomed in 300%, it doesn't give me a whole lot of visibility into the code, but it's there. Um, again, you, like I say, you've got your, your solution explorer over here, so all my files ready to go. So this is a Node application that I wrote uh, just in a couple of hours yesterday to help track some of the feedback I was getting from my students about their groups um, and help make new groups because doing it manually was not fun. Uh, so I whipped this up, and again, if I wanted to run this, all I have to do is hit the F5 key. You get your little debug menu that you're used to, and it's running. I can even come over here and look at the output window, and it'll tell me you know, everything I need to know about what's going on, debug. I even have a terminal that is PowerShell if I want to do stuff right here. And then it doesn't know of any problems, but if it did, this would be the same as your error list in Visual Studio. So let's uh, close this. This is, again, a node application. So in order to launch this, when I hit F5 for the first time, it actually creates this file for me. It's able to find out that this is a node application. It's able to detect what file needs to be launched, set up the current, or sets up the current working directory, and even sets up the, the information to attach to the node debugger. Um, again, all done for me. And once it's done, it's just ready to go. If I want to, though, so I've got this uh, student's controller. Uh, I'm not sure that Edge is going to like that right now. Nope, that's going to take me back to the other screen. I really do like Brave, but it is not great about having multiple windows. So 3000 is your typical node port. If I come in here, okay, so this is my standard page. I just do students, okay, and you can see Visual Studio <coughs> pops up and says, hey, something just happened. Come over here, and again, I can look at whatever I want for my request. So here's the request object. Come over here and see the base URL. There is no body because I didn't send anything. Um, full URL, okay, information about the route, which is what I defined here. But I can go through and actually debug all of this information. So if I come in here, so let that go through. Oop, that's not the one I want to break point, actually. This one is. OK, so we'll go to a web page. This is what I'm using to uh, provide information. So we're just going to pick one of my students at random. So he's going to give feedback to himself. And he's going to give himself a 10. And this will be group 11. Feedback 0. OK, so I can hit the Submit button. Come back over here. And just like you're used to, I can single step through my code. I can look to see what my values were, feedback, the group number, and then the number of feedback. Variables don't necessarily have to make sense, because I was in a hurry when I wrote this. Um, but again, I can go through here, and just like you're used to, I can debug and do whatever else I need to, and away we go. OK, so the last thing that I did before I set this up was to come in and create this new route um, where I can show all student feedback. So if you look over here on the left, here's our Git integration, where Git will actually tell me, hey, you've got to change. I can go over and look at this. And actually, it was able to tell me that, yes, I created this pug route view as well. I can come in and I can add these to be staged. I can enter a message. And I can commit it. And we're done. OK, so I can do everything I need to right from here. Um, in fact, I can even switch bases at some point, or switch branches. I don't think I have any branches on this particular repo. And I don't have any remotes either, or else I could also push and pull and do all that fun stuff as well. 
Um, so Visual Studio Code is everything you expect it to be uh, from big Visual Studio, but it's a lot more lightweight and a lot easier to use for people who are just doing very lightweight projects. If we look at some of our plugins, okay, here's an Arduino plugin. Um, I think there's actually a more up-to-date one than this as well, but I can actually build my Arduino INO files and I can actually deploy them to my device from Visual Studio Code, so I don't even have to use the Arduino IDE anymore. C and C++, okay, again, uh, it's got all your information. It's actually using the Clang compiler by default, but of course you can tell it whatever else one you want to use. C Sharp, okay. Um, Nikki mentioned the .NET Core. This is fantastic for working with the .NET Core. Okay, you have all of your development tools that you do with Visual Studio, the big one, um, all your IntelliSense, your syntax highlighting. Okay, you can build, you can deploy, you can do everything you want to with the .NET Core from Visual Studio Code. So if you're doing this as an indie developer or you're at a company that maybe is a startup and doesn't want to spend a lot of money to get Visual Studio licenses and you don't qualify for the community edition, code is a great alternative. Even has uh, Docker support, which I just passed, which is pretty awesome if you know what Docker is. Okay, um, but it's got everything else. So Python, okay, here's Rust. Has anybody other than myself heard of Rust? Okay, Rust is an awesome language. I really hope it takes off. But it's only existed for what, like a year? Maybe a couple of years? Well, in a released form. But I can build everything right here from Visual Studio. It just exists, and this guy built a plugin for it, and it works well. Okay. Um, lastly, just this plugin I want to show. This one is Script CS. So with the Roslyn compiler from C Sharp, uh, which we've done presentations on before, you can effectively run scripts just like you would any other scripting language, Python, JavaScript, uh, anything else. The command line is part of a build process. Script CS is a runner that helps you do that using the Roslyn compiler. Um, this integrates with it and I can kick off scripts and I can put them as part of my build process and it's you know ready to go and great. I should probably rank this. You probably use that. All right, so back to our Mongo. Um, if I come back into my get request for the students page, oh, I should probably run this. Okay, I'm using this with a Mongo database. And all I've done is I've defined a series of schemas to give it some information so it knows what it should be looking for. Um, for each student, I'm storing their information, their relative proficiency, I guess, whatever they ranked themselves with these different technologies. And then for each feedback, I'm just storing a source ID, a destination ID, a weight or the feedback value, the name of the group they were in, and then the number of the feedback it is, because we have multiple feedbacks per project. And you can see with Mongoose, I, or with Mongo, this Mongoose is a wrapper for it, but I can still reference other tables if I want to. So just because it's a NoSQL database doesn't mean you can't use referential data, you just typically don't. And in this case, it, used, it was better to use referential data and I didn't want to have to worry about getting SQL wired into Node because it's much harder than Mongoose. Um, but these are just some basic schemas to use. Over here in the students section, I have this method, which is get all students, which is where I've breakpointed it. And I've just told it, take that schema, dot find. So it's the same thing we did over here, just the dot find. And that will give me back all of my student records. So I've got 15 of them. Okay, um, it's going to give me all those back. I can come in here, I can perform sorts on it. I can perform maps, so that just filters it down to the ID and the name. Okay, and then over here, again, it's going to be on my student records. And it's just been filtered down to the data I want. I can now send this out to the database, or to the, the view, which will then render it on the screen. And then as you guys saw, I can pick the users from the dropdowns. I can work with them. Away we go. So Mongo is not any different as far as what you would use it for to store data. It's still a database. It's still doing what databases do. The difference is that rather than having to create 
a big SQL statement here to find all students, which wouldn't be hard, select asterisk from students. Okay, I can just do this. Um, have any of you had to deal directly with things like SQL injection? They may not know what SQL injection is. Okay, so SQL injection, if I were to write a SQL script, let's just do this real quick. Okay, so let's say I was getting something back from a request. So we'll do function Okay, so let's say this is a handler for a request of some sort. You could create and say, all right, I want to create, and I'm going to be mixing languages here, a string where you would say, all right, select asterisk from students where s, s dot username, for example, equals And then let's say I would say request dot grams dot username. Actually, we can just terminate it there. Okay, and then something like that. Okay, what's the problem with doing it this way? Somebody could, instead of putting the name in, put in a SQL statement. Right. So this is just doing string concatenation. I would expect when I'm done, it's going to say select asterisk from students s where s dot username equals Bob. Okay. But what I might end up getting is a request coming in from the website that looks something like they've done this and said, all right, let's escape that request character, escape it again, and then say or one equals one, and that's what they actually have pre or appended to the end of this. So we're going to get is select asterisk from students where s dot username equals empty string or one equals one, and what will that do? Return every student record that exists. Not great, especially because they could also do something like this where they say semicolon drop users or whatever table they decide to pick, and now all your user data is gone, or. Uh, update users and set the admin password to whatever they want it to be. Okay, so it's not great. Um, definitely try to avoid doing that wherever you can. I'll turn down the sound. Okay, one nice thing about a NoSQL query is that it's much harder to do something like that because everything is defined as an object. It's real hard to do SQL injection. That's not to say you can't. There are SQL inje injection attacks you can do with NoSQL. But it's much harder. Most people aren't going to know about them unless you're actually in the attacker community. Okay. Um, so we've got some benefits. Again, if you're doing any sort of reporting, it's going to be a lot slower for that. So we've got some drawbacks. But it's a good system and it's worth using. At work, we use it for our C Sharp application where we've said, you know, we have these update packages we want to use. They're going to have update steps. And it just made more sense to group them in together with a NoSQL database and then send them down to the device when we want. Okay, any questions on Mongo or Visual Studio Code or comments? I, I was hoping you'd show us some of the command prompts. The, the, the what? For, like, the import command prompts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't hear you. The control P. Ah, the okay. Um, let's see if I have a project for that one. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. Let's see if I have a project for that one. I may or may not. Actually, yes, I do. I want to keep this open because I'm going to work on that later. So we'll open up a new one. And let's see. Probably Jeopardy. Okay, so this is a project that I have worked on and off, or off and on, on and off, on for a few years. Um, unfortunately, the 2.0 version isn't quite done yet, um, and it hasn't been for about two years, which is great. So I've never used Visual Studio Code with this because it's been that long since I last worked on this. The Visual Studio Code didn't exist last time I tried to use this. So just to kind of show you what it will do, if I hit F5 right now, it's never run this before, and I don't have it set up to know what this is. 
So I can tell it that this is an OJS application. You can see as soon as I do that, it goes, it, it is fine to run it. And I haven't done any of the install stuff to install the dependencies for Node, so it's going to crash before it's able to run. Um, but it's able to figure out what to do and launch my application. Okay, one of the other things I can do is Visual Studio Code has your command prompt? It's not a command prompt. What do you call this? It's a palette. That's what it's called. Okay, and you can hit question mark and it'll show you here are things you can do. Okay, one of the things you can do is this little bracket or the chevron. Okay, and I can tell it to do different things including one which is a task, which is run my build task. Okay, now I've never done that before, so it's gonna say I don't know how to do that. So I'm gonna configure the build task. If you look over here, I'm using gulp, in this particular case, as my build system. So I'll click that, and it will then create this tasks.json file that tells me here's what I need. Okay, so here's my tasks.json. Uh, let's see. So if I do this, I get my IntelliSense. Okay, I can use my tasks, which is what I want. And it'll create the logic for me to do this. So I can come in here and say, actually this needs to be an object. All right, so task name, and we'll say, Build. Okay, and again, I'm using the IntelliSense to do this. Um, I think it's just command, yeah. Okay, and then the command I want to execute, which is going to be go. And we'll just do that because I let the default one work. And then lastly, oh, it's up here, pass it, is build command. And I can say true. Okay, so now that I have this set up, when I come back over here, well actually I can just do it from the, here again. So, build, which I can also do by control shift B. Okay, and again, I don't have anything installed, so it's not gonna run that correctly. But if we look down here, it's gonna try to auto detect tasks for gulp, try to run it. Okay, we'll do this. Uh, over a meter connection, this is going to be painfully slow. Yeah, this might take some time. While this is installing, so I can show the build task. Anybody have any other questions or comments or things they'd like to see about either? Is there anybody who really wants to see the build stuff work? Because this might take a good 20 minutes over a cell connection to get all these. Okay. In that case, I'm just going to kill that. <laughs> Maybe? There we go. Alright, okay. That's code and Mongo. Um, I really encourage you to look at both systems. Um, they're fantastic. I've, I've got, because I'm a professor for, Visual Studio, for Weber State, I actually have the full ultimate edition of Visual Studio for free. And I still find myself using code more often than I do Big Visual Studio is just faster. Um, and then Mongo, I don't think I use SQL Server on this unless I'm doing a class that makes me use SQL Server. Otherwise, Mongo is kind of my go-to thing now. All right, that's all I've got.